Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship and welcome to the worship of the whole morning. We're going to start out by singing a song that's um, uh, not at all unfamiliar to you, okay? And after we sing this song, Soraya is going to offer the invocation. So let's sing, Did You Think to Pray? At number 313 in Hymns of the Restoration. Now we pick that first hymn intentionally for the second verse because the second verse talks about forgiveness. And our theme for this month, condition our hearts, Lord, to forgive. And so that's what everything is pointed toward this morning is forgiveness. Now we were looking for <clears throat> things that we could use and I came across a video. Now the unusual thing about this morning is going to be that that video is going to take about 10 minutes. And that's not something I would ordinarily do. Except when I watched the video, I just looked at it and said, that says better than anything I could say 
what the Lord wants us to understand about forgiveness. And so it was just one of these things where I looked at it, or we looked at it, and we said, if that's the case, then why should we sit up here and blather when that will do the job and do it right? So um, you're going to be seeing a video. Gene's going to read a scripture first here. And then we're going to sit down and watch the video with you. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. This one story in particular has had a profound impact on me. It's about a woman who did the impossible, and it made me ask myself if I could do the same. Renee had four kids. Two of her daughters were twins. Megan was coming home from the beach one night with her best friend when their car was struck by a drunk driver named Eric, a 24-year-old kid. Megan lost her life. Eric killed both girls that were in the car. Renee lost her daughter in an instant. Megan is um, a very joyful child and had a heart of gold, beautiful, loved people, loved her family, um, just a joy of my life. And um, when she was 20 years old, on May 11, 2002, uh, my sister-in-law came to the door to tell me that um, Megan had been in a car accident and she didn't make it. You know, my heart was so broken and I looked at her and said, no, you're kidding. And you know, still looking for her to tell me that, that she's, this is not really true, that Megan wasn't coming back home. Next thing she knows, she finds herself in a courtroom watching this young man, this 24-year-old man, get sentenced to 22 years in prison. After Renee lost her daughter, she said she found herself in the darkest place she'd ever been. This guy Eric was behind bars, but she said she felt like the prisoner. Why? because she had all this bitterness and hatred built up towards that young man. And so she reached out and did the impossible. She reached out to Eric in prison and said, I forgive you. The ripple effects of that act of forgiveness are still being felt today. That young man's life was absolutely changed because this woman forgave him. He said, I can't even forgive myself, and she forgave me. One by one, all of Renee's family members followed her lead and they reached out and expressed forgiveness to Eric. So much so that now they describe Eric as part of their family, like a son to Renee. The story doesn't stop there though. Renee went to the courts along with her family and she was able to have Eric's sentence cut in half from 22 years to 11 years. He told me that day, the, the day of the hearing, that it didn't matter at this point, he said, you know, if, if the judge does not grant this for me, I want you to know that I am so grateful that you are willing to do this. And um, he said, and I will be okay. He said, I'll, I'll be fine. But I'm just, I, he was blown away by the fact that we were willing to go before the judge and, and you know, plead for him to not have to be there for 22 years. thing on your mind today and it always goes to those who don't deserve it. it's the opposite of how you feel when the pain they cause is just too real it takes everything you have to say the word forgiveness i was more than angry at eric I had so much rage inside of me, and yet the moment that I was able to look Eric in his eyes and tell him that I forgive him, you know, that was a moment that healing began for both of us. It's always anger's own worst enemy. And even when the jury and the judge say you got a right to hold a grudge, it's the whisper in your ear saying, set it free. Forgiveness. A judge and a jury telling you that it's okay to hold a grudge 
you know, that's what the world says. It's okay for you to feel that way, which it is. But yet, those feelings, they're inside of you eating away at you, and, and you don't want to live your life that way. Forgiveness. Show me how to love the unlovable. Show me how to reach the unreachable. Help me now to do the impossible. There are people who are not going to ever have someone say to them, I'm sorry for what I did, or I take responsibility for what I did, and you still have to forgive if you want to heal. It can even set a prisoner free. There is no end to what its power can do. So let it go and be amazed by what you see through eyes of grace. The prisoner that it really frees is you. Forgive me. You're not letting go of what happened. You know, it is wrong. It, it should never have happened. It is not okay. It doesn't mean that you're canceling any of that out. But once you are able to say those words and truly mean it, you know, um, then you do find that you're setting a prisoner free. And the prisoner truly is you. Show me how to love the unlovable. Show me how to reach the unreachable. I was immediately inspired by Renee's story when I read it, but it took me a while to write her song. I kept her story in my guitar case for about two years, and I realized the reason why it was so difficult to write this song, Forgiveness, is because it's kind of hard to live that out. That's why the words of the chorus are sung in the form of a prayer. God, show me how. Help me to do the impossible. This story of forgiveness really makes me think that there's some pretty life-defining questions that all revolve around that one word, forgiveness. Questions like, is there somebody that I need to forgive, that I've been holding onto a grudge and it's weighing me down, every step's getting heavier and I just need to set it free? Another question is, is there someone that I need to go and uh, ask for forgiveness from? To say, I'm humbling myself, I'm sorry, no excuses, can we start over? Another forgiveness question, one that Eric has had to deal with in prison is, can I ever forgive myself? What if loving the unlovable means having to learn how to love that person you see when you look in the mirror? Sometimes that's not an easy task, which really leads to the most significant forgiveness question of all, and it's this. Have I ever let it really sink in? The message of God's forgiveness, what he's done for me through his son Jesus dying on a cross for my sins. Renee stood before that judge, along with all of her family members, taking turns, speaking on behalf of a guilty criminal and seeking mercy for him. I'm reminded that somebody has done that for me, somebody has done that for you, and his name is Jesus. For God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why did he do that? So that our stories to discover the healing, the victory, the redemption, the power, the freedom of one word, forgiveness. I think you'll agree that was better than listening to me. 
You know, I wasn't going to do this this morning, but I'm just feeling I need to follow that up with one other thing before we close this, close this part of the service. Um, ran across this morning. I think that the Lord just brings these together, face it. I mean, he just does. And I, I, there was a Christian artist by the name of Mandisa. Uh, some of you are familiar with her, some of you are not. But she died a couple of days ago. She's only 45 years old. But she was on American Idol. And uh, she, uh, well, I think, was one of the top, two, yeah, she was one of the top 12 contestants that year. But uh, Mandisa was quite a bit overweight. And uh, when she came on for her first edition, uh, Simon Cowell made some pretty nasty remarks about her weight. Even though she had a very successful audition, he made some remarks. He said, you know, one of the things he said to, was, do we have a bigger stage this year? And then as she went through, he was continually cutting that way. And uh, uh, the comments really hurt her. And so when the final 12 took the stage, when the final 12 had been selected, when she presented herself to the judges prior to the final cut down, okay, um, she spoke directly to Simon Cowell. And what she said to him was, what I want to say to you is that yes, you hurt me. And I cried and it was painful. It really was. But I want you to know that I've forgiven you and that you don't need someone to apologize in order to forgive somebody. I figure, and this is just beautiful, I figure that if Jesus could die so that all of my wrongs could be forgiven, I can certainly extend that same grace to you. Isn't that a beautiful statement? And it had an effect. Simon Cowell immediately apologized. He just told her, I am humble. But that's what forgiveness is all about. It all roots in the fact that we have received the greatest forgiveness of all. While we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. So let's close this part of the service by singing our Father who in heaven doth dwell.
Good morning, Living Hope. Just have a couple of announcements that I wanted to uh, bring before you. I don't want to step on the on the spirit that has uh, been here. Um, this coming Wednesday is uh, Forging Fellowship. It is uh, our fourth uh, Wednesday service that uh, we have um, that is a little different format. It starts at uh, 545 and gets over at 715. So anybody that, uh, any of the young families that have kids, uh, we prepare a, a meal. And uh, this coming uh, Wednesday, the theme or the format is a, a, much like a campfire. So I would uh, definitely uh, invite you to attend. Uh, the purpose is to uh, become one. And this, uh, the, the turnout has been very well uh, received by the young families. And... Um, my prayer is that uh, as a, a congregation, that as we become one or strive to, that we need to get to, to, to know each other and just uh, fellowship. So I appreciate that. Uh, Thursday is priesthood meeting at 7 o'clock here at the church. Um, Muriel said that uh, somebody donated some bread. Uh, and it's back in the back uh, table back there. If we don't take it today, it'll probably go bad. Um, there is also the women's department. This is in your, uh, in your bulletin, is going to have a women's tea. Uh, that is May 4th, 10 o'clock to uh, noon. So, please be attentive to that. Um, also, birthdays. We have some, a uh, couple birthdays today. Uh, Janet Dixon, who I know is watching. I've communicated with her this morning. Uh, they are down in Texas uh, for some, no, they're, I think they're in the Branson area uh, on that. Also, Monday is Bill Brown's birthday, uh, and Friday is Mary Jo Staten. Uh, any other birthdays that I did not mention? All right, let's uh, sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Our scripture for today is uh, found in Matthew 6, verse 16. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, who trespass, trespass against you, your heavenly Father will also give you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will the heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. And I just wanted to say thank you for the prayers. I'm uh, recovering from my fall up on the top there. I'm very blessed that I don't have any broken bones and uh, except the sinus uh, uh, bone that was broken. So I appreciate your, uh, your prayers and uh, let's, uh, oh, the... Uh, also, uh, thanks, Linda. Uh, next month, come on up. <laughs> okay, um, our day of prayer is um, next week. We still have many, many um, vacancies that people could take a look at this and see if there's a day that they can. Um, or, 
excuse me, an hour that they can sign up, and there'll be announcements on next month. Uh, there'll be a bit of a change in format.
there's a little baby walking around in the aisle and I just kind of wanted to watch her for a minute. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be with you here this morning. I'm glad for everyone that has come today. Our call to worship is Psalms 118, verse 24. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's try that a different way. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. <laughs> Thank you. When Ed told me the t theme of his scripture, I mean his sermon today, that scripture came to mind and I know that... Uh, there's a dear family here that loves to start out their morning that way, and so I thought that would be highly appropriate. <clears throat> Let's uh, turn now and sing hymn number 84, Give Me Thy Heart. And you can stay seated.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you and we praise your name. Lord, I ask that as we come before you, uh, we take a moment to let go of the burdens that have come with us through this past week, month, year. Lord, allow us to, uh, for a moment, find some vulnerability to remember that we need each other, that we need you, and Lord, that you can do miracles in our lives. Lord, I pray that for a moment we can realize we can lean on you. And as we listen to the word, Lord, I just pray that we can begin to forgive those who don't deserve it, to be willing to give to those who don't deserve it. And more importantly, forgive ourselves even when we don't deserve it. Lord, we praise you and uh, open our ears. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I couldn't help but notice some of us have been seated for quite a while at this point. Um, so if y'all could stand up for a second and give a good stretch, greet your neighbor in the name of Jesus and tell him how much you love and care for each other because we're all awesome and brothers and sisters in the Lord. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> I, all right, would the priesthood who are collecting please come forward? And come forward. <laughs> okay. It, it was needed. It was definitely needed. <laughs> okay, we're going to continue with the service now. I just, it's good to see a room full of joyful people. Amen? <laughs> All right, our scripture reading is going to come today for the offertory from Hebrews chapter 6. Um, we're going to start with 18. And verse 18 reads, that by two immutable things in which is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation to who have, um, have a strong consolation who have fled for the refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of our soul, both sure and steadfast, and which endureth to, well, into that within the veil. Since we have a God who is truthful and honest and cannot lie, I'm going to go back a couple of verses and say that in verse 10 it reads, For God is not unrighteousness. Therefore, we will not for well, he will not forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Brothers and sisters, by simply loving and caring for your neighbor and enjoying each other's company today, you were ministering a second ago. All right, I'm going to fall back onto a promise now because I want you to realize that this is an act of faith. We worship a living God who not only is alive because of resurrection, but he has saved us and is in us and lives through us as well. So here is a blessing. Blessed is he that hath considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth. And thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. Uh, I know a lot of people right now are really worried about enemies. And they're concerned about world events and things that are coming upon the scene. And we have to recognize and realize that all those things are going to happen. 
They've been prophesied. But we are here as God's people. We are here as Zion to love and care for each other and to love and care for our fellow neighbor that he may have the comfort and understanding and the peace that we have. And at this time, I want you to have this upon your heart as you um, go through the offering of this uh, today, Lord, and people in this room, that uh, you may consider what you can give and that you, you may be joyful in this moment. May the priesthood please come forward. Would you all bow with me? Our Father who art in heaven, Lord, we are so grateful and thankful for all the many blessings which you have bestowed in our lives. And we are so happy to be each other's brothers and sisters, Lord. Father, I ask that uh, whatever offering that we wish to give or may give or do give, Lord, that it may be consecrated to thy will and thy growth of thy kingdom, Lord. Father, that we may be active participants in the things you wish to happen here today. That we may all truly love and care for each other and may truly take joy in each other's um, victories, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning. The scripture reading is taken from the 12th chapter of Romans, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. May the Lord add a blessing to his words.
was a adjustment in the program. Gene Schmidt is our pianist today. I want to talk a, a minute or two about Ed. Um, 
I've been looking forward to this for a while. Um, I really like Ed. Um, if you've ever, if you've ever had the privilege of having somebody in your life that um, just makes you happy every time you see him, that um, lovingly calls out your faults and uh, enjoys to. Uh, knock you down a peg or two. That's that's how it is for me with Ed. Um, I didn't know him before they moved down from Washington. Some of you knew him from reunions and living in that part of the world, but um, when I heard him share his testimony of sitting in a service and having the Lord say simply to him, it's time knew that Ed was somebody that was maybe jovial about day-to-day -day stuff, but really serious about his relationship with the Lord. So I uh, ask for your attention for him today. Um, in keeping with our potluck, he has somewhat of a buffet sermon prepared. Um, he's going to touch on a number of little things and... Um, Was there anything else? No. Okay. We didn't re we didn't rehearse this. Um, anyway, just um, pray that you would listen to what he has to say, and uh, just um, hope that you will come to come to appreciate and love him as I do. Thanks, Ivan. <laughs> At the same time, I might be picking out his faults. I'm telling him mine, too, sharing mine with him, and I've got lots of them. Uh, good morning and welcome again in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I feel so blessed to be here this morning among you. And my heart was touched when James was doing the offering, and everybody got up and said hi, maybe even to strangers. That was a, that's a sign that the Spirit is here with us this morning, and... Uh, as he said, I've got kind of a buffet or a smorgasbord of what uh, the Lord has put on my heart this morning. So I hope I can convey it in an understanding way. And uh, the theme, I guess you could generally just call it, every day's a good day. Because every day when we get up in the morning, when we wake up, when the Lord wakes us up, and uh, we're still breathing, we're still alive. Our brain is still alive. Our heart is still pumping. So every day, we shouldn't take them for granted. It's good to see Larry back. And it's good to have Bill here also. If something would have happened just a little bit different, we might be here at a memorial service or something today or yesterday or, you know, next Saturday or something. And But they're both here, and they're both walking good and... Uh, Smiling and, <laughs> yes, praise the Lord. You'll notice I like to smile. Sometimes I smile when I'm nervous, but I just like to smile. Brother Jim Nolan, he's, he calls me smiley because I just, I like to smile. It's easier to smile. You use less muscles to smile than you do when you frown. So it's just, it's a good thing. It's, it's kind of hard to smile when you're singing, but you can try. <laughs> um, I just want to touch on the week of Sunday the 7th through the following week of this last, the week before last, and that Sunday the 7th started out at Waldo with uh, our community, our united um, communion, and Larry Cottrell shared, and that's, you know, that's on, that's recorded, and he shared some personal testimonies, and then Sunday night at the Stone Church was kind of the start of the CRE, the uh, conference for that week before last, and David Joyce offered some real powerful stuff. And in Monday, Jeff Van Bibber, Van Bibber at uh, Stone Church, these were all at the Stone Church. His was powerful. All week was real powerful. And it seemed like we were climbing upward. And all those guys were told to preach like it was their last 
time to preach. They were not admonished. They were just given that thought to preach from their heart as it was their, like it was going to be their last time. And after Jeff was uh, Aaron Smith. You can watch all these on the CRE website. He offered some very personal stuff if you didn't see it or watch it online uh, about his life. And then Wednesday, uh, Eric Odita, he offered some real powerful scripture that you don't hear all the time. And uh, it was very good and touching. Thursday, Marlon Gwynn, High Priest Marlon Gwynn, stood up and he said some stuff from the pulpit that, uh, well, Sherry and I looked at each other, it's something we've been waiting to hear a long time. So I just want to pique your interest on that so you'll watch these. And Friday, of course, Brian Mundy finished it up. And uh, all the speakers spoke about taking action and having preparedness, because that's what we need to be. And that's all I'm going to touch on that this morning, just to pique your interest if you didn't see all of them or it's a good thing to go to. So they also talked about hearken. Hearken and action and be prepared. And we all know what hearken means to hear. To hear with our heart. So I want to touch on, you know, Sherry and I were in northern Kentucky for Easter that week before and in Easter Sunday. And uh, we were at uh, going and visiting the uh, Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum with our youngest granddaughter, Abby. She's nine. And uh, that week, seeing Abby read different things, if you haven't been there yet, I recommend you do. It's just eight, hour, eight hours due east of us. And it's quite an experience both places. And some of the stuff that Abby was saying, you know, it was bringing questions to my heart. And she was reading stuff. There's a lot of stuff to read in there, both places. And uh, it was bringing, she was asking questions that I'll have to get back to you on that, Abby. And, uh, and I talked to Sherry about it and pray about it and look up the scriptures, then I could answer her. But it was, it's good for kids, really good for kids. Two nice play structures to play at and stuff. And, um, but this first part, you bring up the first one, Rich. I want to talk a little bit about Easter, and you know the world. The world sees Easter as um, Easter eggs. A lot of the world does Easter eggs and bright pastel colors and stuff. Well, you know that's not what Easter's about. It is a happy day because he ri rose from the dead. He is risen from the dead. But I wanted to talk a little bit about Friday and Thursday. What happened before he was crucified? And that picture you see on the screen in the Smith's uh, Bible Dictionary, it uh, is called a scourge. It's a, usually a carved piece of wood. I know you can't see it real close, but there's some faces carved at both ends of that handle. And it's got three cords or three links of leather on it. And sometimes they attached metal to that. Now, we know that you know, Jesus, Jesus was scourged. He was, uh, it says that in three of the Gospels, or four of the Gospels anyway. And uh, I want to just touch on, go to Matthew 27, 29 through 33. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band. And they stripped him and put on him a purple robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and they mocked him, saying, Hail, King, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put on his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Well, that, you know, that one, and in John 19, it says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. You know, it doesn't really touch on what they did when they scourged him. 
And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. They smacked him and slapped him around with their hands. You know, that, that scourging. I, I found an article on what the Romans, you know, did about the scourging, and that was the rulers, of course, that time. We talked about that in class this morning. He received possibly 39 stripes because the Roman law says 40 was known to kill a man. They wanted him alive. They probably held handfuls of his hair and beard and they probably pulled it out by the roots when you do that with somebody. They wanted him alive. They kicked, punched, and spit on him for hours. They wanted him alive. Until there probably wasn't a single spot on his body that wasn't bruised and bloody. They wanted him alive. They shoved a crown of thorns down on his head so harshly it stuck in his skin. They wanted him alive. After hours of being beaten, mocked, whipped, flogged, and tortured, they made him carry a chunk of wood. Probably pretty rough cut. Slivers. They wanted him alive. They wanted him to feel every ounce of pain that a physical person could feel. He had to feel that pain in order to heal us, to save us. And back then, crucifixion, probably now, even today, was historically one of the cruelest, most tortured deaths a human could face. Probably why we don't do it anymore. It's hours upon hours of torture. Torture that most of us can't even mentally imagine how bad. This kind of cruelty just isn't normal. It's not something our minds can comprehend. There's nothing happy about the day Jesus died. Of course, there was the day he rose. The day he died, he went through a lot of pain and suffering for us the most that any man can. And he had done nothing wrong. He hadn't even had a bad thought. You know, and he could have stopped it all. He could have called the ministry of angels or whatever. He could have stopped it all. But he didn't. He also knew that in order to have Sunday, there had to be Friday. He had to be crucified so he could rise from the dead. You know, he felt all of our burdens and all of our sorrows right then and there. He carried the weight of everything for everyone, past, present, and future, for every one of us. He leveled the playing field for all of us. He made it so we all have a chance to get back to him. He said all of us are worth it. Every one of us. He loves us all. He never promised we'd have to carry a burden, heavy burden in our lives. His wasn't. You know, and his promise is that Sunday is coming. No matter how heavy Friday is, financially, emotionally, mentally, or physically for any of us, Friday can be heavy. That cross is weighing us down. We might even be about to crumble under its weight. His promise was simply this. He won't make us carry it alone. He's always there with us. What kind of king would step down from his throne for us? Would do this for us? What kind? Probably one that loves us more than we'll ever know and comprehend and understand. That king is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of God. He did every bit of it for you and for me. 
Yes, it was heavy. And whatever our problems are could be heavy. But look up, because Sunday is coming. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears. That's enough on that, just to have you think about all the pain. I don't know if any of you have seen The Passion, the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion. That one showed a lot. Okay, this next part is a question that sometimes we get asked. It's, uh, it's called, uh, did God create evil? And this is just one way we can look at it and understand. Let's go back to the beginning for this. In First Genesis, chapter 1, the 33rd verse, the last verse of chapter 1, it reads, And I, God, saw everything that I had made, and behold, all things which I had made were very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. All things he'd made were very good. He didn't make anything bad. And chapter 2 picks up with, Thus the heaven and the earth were finished, and all the host of, and all the host of them. So he made all of us too. And on the seventh day, I, God, ended my work and all things which I had made. And I rested on the seventh day from all my work. And all things which I had made were finished. And I, God, saw that they were good. Everything he made was good. So somebody asked you this, why did God create evil? And that, when I first heard that, I thought, boy, that, that stuck in my head, stuck in the core of my soul. So here's a little story about a professor at a university who asked his students the following question. He says, um, everything that exists was created by God, right? And they, yeah, they all nodded, yes, yes, like you probably would, like I just read. And so he says, did God create everything? He asked this again now. And one of the students replied, yes, sir. So the professor then said, if God created everything, then God created evil, since it exists. And according to the principle that our deeds define ourselves, then God is evil. So you know what the principle, I had to look up what the principle of our deeds was, is. And uh, our deeds testify of our faith. And it says that in Mosiah chapter 249. And the second one, our deeds raise us above the dross of this world. And everybody knows what dross is. It's when you're heating up metal, it's what floats at the top. The stuff, the impurities that are in the metal that you don't want, you want to skim them off and get them out of there. So our deeds raise up, rise up above the dross of this world. Raise us above if we're doing the right kind of deeds. And our deeds as a beacon illuminating the way, a beacon of light. Are we that light in our deeds? So the student became silent after hearing such an answer that, you know, God created evil. The professor was very pleased with himself. He boasted to the students for proving once again that faith in God is a myth. Now another student raised his hand and said, can I ask you a question, professor? And the rep uh, professor replied, of course. So he says, uh, professor, is cold a thing? And the professor said, well, of course it is. You know, we feel it all the time. We feel cold when we go out and it's snowing. He says, what kind of question is that? You know, and the other students laugh at the young man's question because he says, is cold a thing? So the young man answers, actually, sir, Cold doesn't exist. You guys might be thinking, you're crazy, Ed. We know it's cold. It gets cold sometimes. So the, this guy, he says, according to the law of physics, what we consider cold is actually the absence of heat. 
A, a person can be studied on whether a person or object can be studied on whether it has or transmits, transmits energy. And science tells us that absolute zero is 459, minus 459.67 degrees, so about minus 460 degrees is absolute zero. Can't get any colder than that. And at that minus 460, all matter becomes inert and unable to react at this temperature. It will not move. Cold does not exist. We created this word to describe what we feel in the absence of heat. The absence of heat causes cold. It's a cause. And a cause is to do something to make something happen. That's a cause. So this student, he continued and he says, he asked the professor, does dark exist? And the professor, of course, he says, yes, it exists. And he says, sir, you're wrong again. Darkness also doesn't exist. Darkness is actually the absence of light. And you know, Genesis 1-4, and everybody knows these. And the earth was without form and void. And I caused darkness to come upon the face of the deep. You know, if God was there, there was light. We know that God and Jesus, they're light. They're not darkness. So God caused the darkness. He did something to cause it. Is any of this making sense so far? Have you ever been in a dark space? We have this place near, well, we went to this place near Mount St. Helens, real close to the base of Mount St. Helens, and it's called the Ape Caves. And you go down in these caves and they've got trails marked out. And you go down a stairway into a deep area and then once you get back towards the caves, it's the darkest I've ever been in. I mean, you can put your hand right in front of your face and you can't see your fingers. Sherry took, some daycare kids, I think, or the scouts or something down there, too, and yeah. And you just sit in the darkness like that, and it's darker than, well, it's darker than when you close your eyes, and it's the complete absence of light. So darkness is the term that man uses to describe the absence of light. And that's the absence of light that causes the darkness. So in the end, after the student had asked him this, the, the student says, sir, so does evil exist? And this time it was uncertain. And the professor answered, of course, as I said before, we see it every day. Cruelty, numerous crimes, and violence throughout the world, and all the hate. These examples are nothing but a manifestation of evil. And that's what the professor said. So the student says, evil does not exist, sir, or at least it doesn't exist for itself. There's got to be something missing. Evil is simply the absence of God. It is like the darkness and the cold the absence of light and the absence of heat. Pretty basic to understand. I think I'm starting to get an understanding of it. Evil is a man-made word to describe the absence of God. He didn't make evil. I just read it in Genesis. I could read it again if you wanted me to. It's just the absence of him and his son. Evil is not faith or love or mercy, or grace, or anything good that God created. Faith and love, they, all those exist as light and warmth. Evil is the result of the absence of divine love in the human heart. 
It's the kind of cold that comes when there's no heat and the kind of darkness that comes when there's no light. Okay. I'm going to shift gears again. Um, some of the older people here probably remember Charlie Chaplin. He was a comedian. He's also a pretty good man, I found out, reading up on him. And he died December 25th, 1977. Sherry and I had been dating for two months at that point when he passed away. On Christmas Day, he passed away. Anyway, he wrote some stuff down before he passed away, and I'd like to share a couple of these things. Um, nothing in, is eternal in this world, not even our problems. The only thing we have is eternal is our spirit which we've had from day one with the Lord when he created us in heaven, all the hosts of heaven. And he says, uh, I'd like, I like to walk in the rain because no one can see my tears. The most wasted day in life is the day we don't laugh. I try to live by that, even if I laugh at myself and try not to laugh at somebody else that's, you know, fallen down or something. You know, laugh at the right things when you're going to laugh. Smile and laugh. The best six doctors in the world, we know that our Lord and Savior is the great physician, but the best six doctors in the world, physical doctors, sunshine, rest, exercise, diet, self-esteem, and friends. This is what Charlie had written down should keep them in all stages of our life and enjoy a healthy life with those six things. If you see the moon, you will see the beauty of God. If you see the sun, you will see the power of God, the sun, S-U-N, the sun, the heat. If you look in the mirror, you'll see God's best creation. Myself, when I go by the mirror, I try to go by like this, so I don't have to look at it. We're all tourists. God is our travel agent. And he's already made our itineraries, our bookings, and our destinations. If we live for him, we know where our final destination will be. He said, trust him and enjoy. Life is a journey. Live today. Every day is a good day. Okay, the next, next slide. Rich, okay. This looks like an AI, uh, artificial intelligence generated slide. But I wanted to share a quick little story here about a sheep rancher and, and what he had to say about this. And I didn't know about this until I started digging deep into it and checking facts and everything. This rancher says, a rattlesnake bit one of my sheep in the face about a week ago. And it's the deadliest snake that lives right around where he lives. I know there's some pretty bad snakes around here too. The copperhead and the water moccasin. There's also a viper out there too. And, the, and these four snakes, I'm going to let you know in a second about that. So the, the, the lamb, the sheep, got bit in the face by a rattlesnake, and we have them out west, the timber rattlers. And the sheep's face was swollen and hurt. I'm sure, and the farmer said it looked like it hurt like crazy. It swelled up. But the old rattler did not know the type of blood that runs in that sheep. And this is something that I just learned recently. And I've talked to people about it. They go, oh, I didn't know that. So I'm not the only one. Now, the antidote that we get for snake bites is usually taken from sheep's blood. They have an enzyme in their blood. The sheep was swollen for about two days, but the blood of the lamb destroyed the serpent's venom. You know, the, the farmer was worried, but the sheep didn't care. He kept eating, he kept drinking, and he kept walking because he knew he was fine. So... We don't need to worry in life when the serpent bites us. And I'm talking about the adversary, of course. Just be sure that the lamb's blood is flowing through your veins. 
So yeah, you can look it up later on your phones. Snops it. Lamb, the blood that flows through lambs. And that is uh, how they get one of the antidotes for rattlers, copperheads, vipers, and water moccasins. And I don't think that's a coincidence. God doesn't do coincidences. But lamb, sheep's blood, is impervious to snake bites. Does his blood flow through our veins? Next slide. Okay, what you see is a sheepdog. And the sheepdog is covered in his own blood. And that's after fighting off wolves to protect the sheep, to protect his flock. And that sheep there, this is a real picture. That sheep there is uh, comforting that sheepdog, touching, going face to face with that sheepdog. Regardless of how physically strong or emotionally tough that someone or like a dog is, showing them how much you appreciate their efforts goes a long way. The dog is willing to die for his sheep, and the gesture of the sheep comforting him is all he needs. And he wasn't asking for that, but the sheep right there is comforting him. Never take someone for granted who is willing to fight for you or stand by you in your time of need. Appreciate their efforts and show them that you're grateful when somebody does something for you. Whether it's, you know, save your life, of course you're going to, but any of the little things. The Lord wants us to thank people for that. And I wanted to thank the Schmitz for what they brought this morning for the worship and that, that video, the song by Matt Smith, Forgiveness. That would have been tough for, for me to forgive. But when we forgive, we forgive, and it removes the burden from us. That's what God wants us to do no matter what. Jesus was willing to die for us all. And he's always there to comfort us. I'm almost done. So this one is for the younger parents with younger kids or anybody that comes up to you and asks you, what size is God? Have you ever been asked that question? So this little boy asked his father, what, what size is God, Dad? And his father, they were outside, and his father pointed way up there in the air and said, see that airplane up there? And the little boy said, yeah. It's pretty small. And he says, yep. So his father takes him to the airport. And he says, uh, and they, they walk in the terminal, you know, and, see that plane right there? And, and the boy goes, wow, that's big. He says, that's the same size as that plane that was up in the air. But what he was trying to tell him, he says, uh, God's size depends upon how close or how far you are from him. When we're close to him, and he's close in our lives, and he can work in our lives. His son will work in our lives when we're close to him. If we're far away from him, he's probably not going to work in our lives. He still has his hand out and wants us, still wants to draw us to him. But he'll work in our lives the closer we are to him. And one more thing, if, if, if all of you remember back, the, I think it was the first Sunday, and Bob Dixon was speaking, our former pastor. Larry had just taken over, but uh, Bob had us... Uh, gave us all a piece of paper, and he had us write not so much a New Year's resolution, but how we want to change our lives this year. And so we wrote on that piece of paper. And I wrote on mine, I, I want to share that with you, that uh, I wrote, I want to be more like Jesus and less like myself. I stumble and fall way too often. I wrote that on there, and I found this. And this year, I want to be more like Jesus, less like myself. And there's a lot of easy ways that we can be more like Jesus, and this just has six of them on there. And we can uh, 
hang out with sinners. Like I'm doing today. I know we're all sinners here. That's a pretty easy thing to do. Anybody we come in contact with. Jesus hung out with sinners. Although he wasn't one one. He wasn't one. We can upset religious people too. He upset the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those high priests and everything. He upset them just by saying the truth and showing them love. We can tell stories that make people think. So the more we learn about scripture, the more we can tell stories that make people think. I hope that I made some of you think today. I know I had to think preparing this. I almost gave myself an headache. We should uh, also choose unpopular friends. You know, in, in the kids that are in school, it's easy to group up with your, the people that are real popular. And hopefully they'll accept you so you can be popular too. Or at work, you know. There's always pop, more popular people at work. Sherry and I are blessed to be retired, so still, still doing a lot of work. <laughs> but um, even with the unpopular people, say hi. Shake their hand. Let's come out for a cup of coffee or something. This one's pretty easy, too. Be kind, loving, and merciful. Sometimes we find it hard to be that way, kind, loving, and merciful, but we can. We can. Every day we wake up in the morning, and he was just kind, loving, and merciful to us. We woke up. Who knows what tomorrow's going to bring? Did Bill think that he was going to go underneath the tractor when he was here? Doing stuff for the church? No. Did Larry think the ladder was going to come down and he was going to follow it on down? No. We don't know. We could be gone when we get it, pull out of this parking lot, and turn out, and don't see a traffic or something. We take so much for granted. Every day is a good day. And the last one here I thought was pretty cute. Something that Jesus did that we can be like him. Take naps on boats. If you have a boat or a friend with a boat. I've had naps on boats before. Never owned a boat other than a little six-foot fiberglass rowboat. <laughs> but uh, Take naps on boats. He did that. That's, so, so much that Jesus did is fairly easy. And we can do that too and make every day a good day. I want to close with Moroni, chapter 7, and the last verse in chapter 7. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart that ye may be filled with this love which he hath bestowed upon all who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, that we may have this hope, that we may be purified even as he is pure. Amen. Thank you, Ed. Boy, I look forward to... Uh telling my wife that I want to be more like Jesus and I'm buying a boat. <laughs> I know it's not traditional for us to have a pastoral prayer except on uh, Communion Sunday, but as your almost pastor, I just um, felt impressed to do that. And um, Brother Thomas handed me a slip of paper. Um, his dad, David, is in the ER. Um, don't know any more details. Sarah, do you guys know anything about it? Oh, okay. Thomas, do you know anything more? Is it bad? Is... Okay. Okay, that doesn't sound too good. All right. Well, if you join me, we're going to pray for David and um, our Father art in heaven. Father, every day is a gift from you. You put the sun in the sky, and you put the grass on the ground, and you put breath in our lungs, and Father, sometimes, sometimes you give us challenges, 
Sometimes you allow our mortality to um, give us opportunities to, to turn to you. Father, um, this morning we would remember David McLean in our prayer. Father, you're, you're acutely aware of um, the needs that he has, and so in the name of Jesus Christ, we um, pray for him in that ER room that all would be well and that things would work out. Father, uh, we give you thanks for the, the ways in which you have delivered delivered us and saved us from things that could be worse. Father, I thank you that Larry and Bill are here today. Lord, there are so many so many things that happen around us that could just wipe us out and so many times we never know. But Lord, our faith, our trust is that your hand is there and <clears throat> Father, this morning, um, I would pray for for those of our church family that have questions about their housing situation, that they might um, find security and a home. Father, I would pray for those um, that are bored with their life, that they might find fulfillment. Lord, I would pray for those that are fearful as they look around the world and see things in faraway lands and things here in the United States that are uncomfortable and unsettling and lean on you. Father, you've, you've asked us to, to look toward your son, Jesus Christ, who was lifted up for the world to see. Lord, in all these difficulties, it's easy to be overwhelmed. It's easy to be distracted. But Father, please help us to remember that relying on you really is just that simple. Father, you're kind and good, and uh, your mercies are everlasting. We just praise you and give you all glory and in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and... Um, Sing where he leads me.
Before I pray, uh, I've got good news for you. That good news is that Jesus loves each one of you. He loves you all the way to the cross. So uh, let, let's remember that, that how, much, how much love there is for each one of you. So be kind to each other. Put, put your brother before yourself. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we've had together. We thank you for this day of your creation. We thank you for the most precious gift of life you've given to each of us. We love you, Lord, and we pray for forgiveness that you can send your Holy Spirit to be with us. Because we realize when your Holy Spirit is with us, we can do mighty things in your name. And that's what this world needs, Lord. It needs a people that, are, that, that, are, that put you first and have your Holy Spirit with them for they can do mighty things in your, in your name in these last days. So, Lord, we love you and we give you all the honor and glory and pray for your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So be with us, Lord. Continue to guide and direct us is my prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. are blazing so let's raise our candles and light up the sky praying to our father in the name of jesus make us a beacon in darkest times carry your candle run to the hopeless deceived 
your world.